Hello everyone, medium sized video this time. We're going to be looking at renal tubular physiology and the mode of action of diuretics. For background, I'm an Australian ICU trainee pre-primary exam. I don't have any financial conflicts of interest regarding drugs, books or anything else. I half wanted to call this not just frisomide because it's the only diuretic we seem to use in ICU, but there's some fascinating physiology here and we should know how to make the most of different treatments. It's one area I hadn't studied in a lot of depth before. In particular, I found some of the transcellular transport mechanisms a bit daunting, but this will hopefully provide a nice visual reference for some of the concepts. Some quick terminology. A diuretic is a drug that increases urine output. A naturetic is a drug that increases urine, urinary sodium loss. These are sometimes called saluretics in the past, the saline. Sodium excretion increases urine output, and this is how most diuretics work. The body excretes or retains sodium to regulate blood volume. An aquaretic is a drug that promotes urinary free water loss. The body excretes or retains water primarily to regulate osmolality. We typically use diuretics because due to some pathological process such as heart failure, a patient's body is mounted an inappropriate neurohormonal response in an attempt to conserve extracellular fluid volume, leading to a state of volume overload. Some brief anatomy. This is a kidney. Its main jobs involve regulating body fluid volume and composition, including acid-base status and osmolality, as well as metabolism and elimination of some nitrogenous waste products, such as urea and many xenobiotics. Kidneys have a number of endocrine functions, including activation of vitamin D to calcitriol, production of erythropoiesin and renin, which is one part of the kidney's broader role in regulating blood pressure. The parenchyma of the kidney is divided into a renal cortex and medulla. The medulla is divided into inner and outer sections, and the outer medulla is divided into an outer and inner stripe. Those three cones pointing up represent medullary rays. There are broadly two types of nephron, superficial and juxtamedullary. The blood supply of the kidney is unique as it's a portal arterial system. You have a series of arteries ultimately leading to afferent arterioles. This enters the first capillary bed, which is the glomerulus and drains into an efferent arteriole. In the deep juxtamedullary nephrons, the efferent arteriole continues into the vasa recta, which are a sparse capillary network that supply the medulla and specifically the loops of Henle. In more superficial nephrons, the efferent arterioles form the peritubular capillary beds. I've just shown two nephrons worth, but these actually form a continuous network that perfuses the renal parenchyma. This portal system means that almost the entire blood, renal blood supply participates in glomerular filtration. So this is a nephron. There are several ways to subdivide it, and we'll discuss some. In pure descriptive terms, there is the glomerulus, a proximal convolution, a loop, a distal convolution, and collecting ducts. Obviously, the glomerulus is where plasma filtration takes place. As we'll discuss in a minute, there is normally a massive volume of fluid and solute filtered, so the vast majority of this needs to be reabsorbed. Most of this happens in the proximal convolution. The loop of Henle exists primarily to generate a concentration gradient in the medulla using a countercurrent mechanism and then also to dilute the urine with more solute removal taking place in the thick ascending portion. The distal convolution um, and early collecting ducts serve to fine tune the composition, particularly in terms of solute reabsorption, and this is where a lot of hormonal mechanisms come into play. Finally, the converging collecting ducts collect urine perform the essential task of extracting free water to regulate body osmolality, as well as some final regulatory touches to sodium, potassium, and especially acid-base status. Each segment can be further divided. For example, the proximal tubule before the thin descending limb is divided into segments one, two, and three, called S1, S2, and S3, with part of two and three forming the so-called proximal straight tubule. Then there is a descending thin limb, which undergoes a hairpin turn, ascends, and becomes the thick ascending limb. After that, the area marked in black is the macula densa, which forms part of the juxta glomerular apparatus, which we'll discuss later. 
the distal convoluted tubule is typically divided into early and late portions. There is also the connecting tubule, which contains features of the DCT and the collecting ducts. Some even include a subsegment as the tubes merge called the initial collecting tubule. Finally, the collecting ducts are divided according to their location in the kidney, cortical, outer medullary and inner medullary. I'm going to use the same color scheme throughout so we can better follow where we are. This isn't the focus of the talk, but it is the starting point for tubular fluid, so I need to talk a bit about the glomerulus. It uses a pressure gradient between the afferent and efferent arterioles to drive fluid and small particles into the initial part of the nephron known as Bowman's capsule. To quantify this, we'll start with cardiac output. And I've done a couple of unit conversions so we can get the best possible understanding of the flow rates we're talking about. A typical resting adult cardiac output is about four and a half liters per minute, which is 270 liters per hour or six and a half thousand liters per day. Now, about a quarter of that goes to the kidneys, which is incredible because together they make up about 0.4% of the body's weight. This is naturally called the renal blood flow, and the reason it's so high is for practically all of it to participate in glomerular filtration. But blood has a bunch of cells in it, so what we really need is the amount of plasma that flows through the glomerulus because cells aren't filtered. We call this the renal plasma flow, and it's the RBV times one minus the packed cell volume or hematocrit. That's typically about 0.43 or 43%. Our multiplier is one minus this, which gives the proportion of the blood's volume that's not occupied by cells, which is about 56%. Finally, we multiply by the filtration fraction, which is typically about 20%. This is the proportion of plasma volume that enters the nephron as tubular fluid. The fluid brings with it small solutes like electrolytes and glucose, but usually excludes cells and large proteins. From here, we have the glomerular filtration rate, which we try to estimate as a measure of renal function on patients every day. This is still a staggeringly large amount of fluid. If we were to have a, a glomerular filtration rate of 125 mils per minute, that's 7.5 liters per hour or 180 liters per day. This is the volume of fluid flowing into the nephron. At this point, it almost has the same composition as serum. We're now looking at the wall of the pro proximal tubular epithelium, which separates the tubular fluid from the surrounding interstitial fluid. On the apical membrane, the proximal tubule cells are distinct because of their microvilli, which provide more surface area for transport proteins. On the other side are the basolateral membranes, which is everything that's not leading to tubular fluid. These are separated from each other by tight junctions. The distinction between apical and basolateral membranes is extremely important in how these systems work. Like I said, the initial tubular fluid is very similar to serum, containing water as well as ions and small molecules in roughly the same concentrations as plasma. A lot of the stuff we need back, so the proximal tubule works very hard to reabsorb it. For example, as most of the body's sodium is freely dissolved in extracellular fluid, the equivalent of the entire body's sodium content is filtered about every two hours, and about 90%, 99% of that needs to be reabsorbed. Sodium reabsorption takes place in different quantities and ways throughout the nephron, and different diuretic classes reduce body fluid volume by interrupting the reabsorption process. The proximal tubule will consistently reabsorb about 65% or two thirds of the GFR. This variable capacity helps compensate for changes in GFR over time. This adaptation is known as glomerulotubular balance. You see some adaptation in other segments, but not as great as in the proximal tubule. Proximal solute reabsorption can also be upregulated by angiotensin II signaling, specifically for sodium. So how does all of this work? Well, likely the most important transport mechanism in renal tubules, as with many cells, is the sodium potassium ATPase. This powers everything in the proximal tubule and most of the nephron. It starts with an ATP molecule binding inside the basolateral membrane where it's joined by three sodium ions. The ATP then hydrolyzes, leaving a phosphate, and the transporter changes conformation, dumping sodium ions into the interstitial fluid, a bit like an excavator bucket. 
At that point, two potassium ions bind to the outside, triggering the phosphate to be released. The transporter contorts back, releasing potassium into the cell, and the baso the basolateral membranes of tubular cells are covered in sodium potassium ATPases, which can constantly pump sodium out and potassium in. The energy required is why these proximal cells are about 30% mitochondria by volume. The massive downhill sodium gradient from the tubular fluid to the intercellular space is an engine that drives the absorption of very useful, various useful solutes that need reclamation and then ultimately water in an equivalent quantity. Let's look at an example. Glucose is easily filtered at the glomerulus, which is suboptimal for metabolism and needs to be reclaimed. Under usual conditions, almost all filtered glucose is reabsorbed into the proximal tubule, with 90 to 97% occurring via the sodium glucose link transporter SGLT2 in the S1 and S2 segments. The remaining 3 to 10% occurs through SGLT1 in the S3 segment. This time, one sodium and one glucose bind on the luminal side of the apical membrane, and together they are dumped into the cell. They don't need ATP as sodium is going down its steep concentration gradient, pulling glucose along with it. The sodium is immediately pumped into the interstitium by the sodium potassium ATPase, and the glucose will passively follow, diffusing out through the GLUT1 and GLUT2 channels. The transporters are inhi inhibited by the relatively new class of hypoglycemic agents, including um, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. This is a unique form of glycemic control, um, as blood glucose is just urinated out, avoiding any hormonal or metabolic controls completely. This shortcut has also generated the notorious risk of euglycemic, uh, typically euglycemic ketoacidosis, as the removal of glucose without utilizing it within cells amplifies the intracellular starvation response that's seen in relative insulin deficiency. These drugs also inhibit sodium reabsorption, although this effect is much smaller than that for glucose. One reason why is that most of the glucose is still reabsorbed in S3 by SGLT1, although this time SGLT1 uses two sodium ions for each glucose. More generally, the nephron is much better at compensating for tubular sodium loss if it occurs more proximally. And finally, there's a lot, of sodium ion, a lot more sodium ions than glucose molecules, and sodium is driving a lot of different processes. While sodium ions can diffuse to some extent on their own due to the high gradient. Um, the process is much more efficient if it's accompanied by an anion due to electroneutrality. In other segments of the nephron, this anion is usually chloride, which reflects the pair's status as the main ions in the blood. However, in the proximal tubule, the main ion reabsorbed with sodium is actually bicarbonate. If you're a fan of the physicochemical or Stewart theory of acid base, you would know that bicarbonate is not a normal ion. It is an ephemeral substance that phases in and out of existence in equilibrium with carbonic acid and carbon dioxide. The equilibrium is reached faster with the aid of carbonic anhydrase enzymes. For example, this CA4, which is anchored on the outside of apical microvilli. Unlike dissolved ions, carbon dioxide is a nonpolar dissolved gas which can freely diffuse across membranes and therefore generate new proton bicarbonate pairs anywhere at once if the enzyme is present. The proximal tubule cleverly exploits this to actively reabsorb bicarbonate and sodium in an indirect fashion. First, sodium enters crossing into the cell across the apical membrane using the NHE3 antiporter, which exchanges it with a proton from inside the cell. This is efficient because it's down sodium's concentration gradient and doesn't have an electrical penalty because it's swapped for another cation, H+. Now the proton is in the lumen and in the presence of bicarbonate and carbonic anhydrase, it pushes the reaction back towards CO2 and the CO2 can diffuse into the cell. Now inside the cell, we now have CO2, carbonic anhydrase, and a relative lack of protons. So the reaction moves back to the right, 
um, making a proton which is recycled and now an intracellular bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate and the sodium ion diffuse together into the interstitial space with the aid of an NBC symporter. The diuretic acetazolamide inhibits carbonic anhydrase, slowing the two essential equilibrium reactions and therefore this whole process of sodium bicarbonate reabsorption. There are many isoforms of carbonic anhydrase in the kidney, um, but the most important are two, which is intracellular, and four, which is bound to the outside of apical membranes. This process of sodium bicarbonate reabsorption uh, accounts for about um, a third of the sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. As solutes are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, water follows passively um, through osmosis. This is possible because membranes are permeable to water due to the presence of channels known as aquaporins, in this case aquaporin 1. The process is known as isoosmolar um, because, because solvent and solute move in equivalent quantities and as a result the overall osmolality of either side doesn't significantly change. Osmolar diuretics such as mannitol simply exist in large osmol osmotically active quantities and are filtered into the tubular fluid and remain there with minimal reabsorption. This inhibits the passive reabsorption of water. While absorption in the proximal tubule is isoosmolar, the relative concentration of solutes may change. For example, urea is not actively reabsorbed, um, so it exists in a relatively high concentration as it moves through the tubule and the quantity of the surrounding substances and water in, uh, decline. This creates a relatively greater diffusion gradient for urea, so a significant quantity is passively reabsorbed. This is known as solute drag, and I'll discuss it slightly more later on. After the proximal tubule, we have the loop of Henle. The role of this is to generate an osmolar concentration gradient in the interstitium, which increases with depth into the medulla. This is used once filtrate reaches the collecting ducts to passively draw out water as required and concentrate the urine. It creates this gradient using a countercurrent multiplication mechanism. Now this can be a tricky concept to understand, so I'll go through a numerical model that demonstrates how the gradient can be created. The loop of Henle can be thought of as having a thin descending limb and a thick ascending limb with a zone of interstitial space between and around them. We know that plasma normally has an osmolality of about 290, let's say 300, and that the absorption of water and solute in the proximal tubule is isoosmolar, so the overall osmolality of filtrate does not significantly change. Therefore, the fluid entering the tubule will have an osmolality of approximately 300 milliosmoles per kilo. At the start of the model, we'll imagine that the interstitial fluid is also the same osmolality. The thin descending limb is essentially impervious to solute, but it is permeable to water as it contains aquaporin 1 channels, while the thick ascending limb is impervious to water. The countercurrent mechanism relies on two principles. The first is the so-called single effect, um, and the other is the flow of fluid. The single effect is the active extrusion of both sodium and chloride ions from the fluid in the lumen of the thick ascending limb to create a concentration gradient from high osmolality outside the tube to lower osmolality inside the tube. We'll look at the actual mechanism of this shortly, but for now you can assume that this continues until it reaches a certain difference. In this example, 200 milliosmoles before the gradient is too high to pump against. Imagine that for each iteration, the pumps will shift osmolality until they create a gradient of 200 um, between the ascending tubule concentration and the interstitial fluid at that level. Now the ascending pumps have done their bit, let's look at the descending tubule. The osmolality outside is now 100 higher than inside the tubule. Since the descending tubule is only permeable to water, water diffuses out until the osmolalities match. The excess water is rapidly removed from the interstitium by the ascending hyperosmolar blood in the vasa recta. Now we have a descending tube with a higher osmolality than both the baseline and the ascending tube. The second major step is the flow of tubular fluid. Uh, 
Now let's advance that flow by four levels. Now we have the first hint of a gradient. The 400 milliosmolar fluid from the descending part has now occupied both lower halves. The top of the descending limb is filled with new filtrate with the original 300 milliosmolars, and the top of the ascending limb has the remaining fluid that was diluted to 200 by the pumps. For each imaginary step in this process, the pumps create a new gradient. Looking at the top half of the ascending limb, there is already a 200 gradient uh, gradient there between um, that and the interstitial space, so those pumps don't have to do anything. Although on the lower half of the ascending limb, it's 400 and 400, so the pumps now have to shift another 100 from inside to out. Okay, gradient established. Now let's look at the descending limb on the left. The interstitium is now more concentrated, so again water has to diffuse out until they match. Next, we'll advance in a smaller three-level step. As you can see, the process repeats itself, and now you can see a more granular and amplified gradient starting to form. Let's go again with a two-level step. You should definitely be able to see that the interstitial gradient is becoming stronger with depth now. One more step. The process will continue to generate a stronger gradient until dissipating forces reach a steady state. An important feature of renal anatomy is that the vas vasorector follow the loops down and ascend back through the same gradient. This allows water and solutes to equilibrate both on the way down and back up. If the vessels were to drain back into the circulation in the same direction as the collecting ducts, it would rapidly disperse the concentration gradient. Even this arrangement is only somewhat preserving of the concentration gradient, because if blood flow increases, the concentration ability decreases. This has a useful effect of enhancing concentrating ability when perfusion is poor, for example in hypovolemia, and reducing concentration ability in volume overload states when there is a large amount of intravascular fluid. Unfortunately, after all that, I'm now going to tell you that all of this sodium chloride concentration only generates about half of the actual osmolar gradient. The other half comes from urea. Everything I've said about the loop so far applies down to the border between the outer medulla and the inner medulla. Notice that's as low as the thick ascending loop begins. Salt gets you to about 600 milliosmoles. Urea provides the rest at lower levels. So where does it come from? Urea is freely filtered at the glomerulus into the proximal tubule where about half of it is reabsorbed through solute drag as mentioned before. As a small, relatively non-polar molecule, Urea can slowly diffuse through membranes unaided, but specific channels greatly accelerate this. As the thin loop descends into the medulla, urea is actually secreted into the tubular fluid from the high concentration interstitium. It then travels up the thick ascending limb and the distal tubule and down the collecting duct until it reaches the inner medulla. At this point, urea can be reabsorbed from the high concentration tubular fluid via vasopressin regulated channels, leaving 35 to 50% of the filtered urea to be excreted. This process is known as urea recycling. It provides a pool of osmotically active solute sequestered within the kidney and able to be used if required to enhance the osmolar gradient, potentially up to 1,200 milliosmoles per kilo. A small amount, roughly 5%, can leak back into the circulation through the vasorector which is much more efficient than the interstitial, so, uh, interstitial sodium chloride, most of which eventually returns to the systemic circulation. Like the proximal tubule, the thick ascending limb is very metabolically active, using the most energy per mass of any segment and absorbing around three quarters of the solute particles that enter. This works out to about 25% of filtered sodium. Also like the proximal tubule, it runs off the basolateral sodium potassium ATPase, but uses different apical channels. The key functional element of these cells is the NKCC2 transporter, which absorbs one sodium ion, one potassium ion, and two chloride ions, relying again on the lumen to intracellular sodium gradient. We know that the sodium is going to be pulled straight out through the basolateral ATPase, but what happens to the others? Also, in the countercurrent section, I only mentioned sodium chloride, not potassium. Essentially, the cell doesn't absorb potassium, it recycles it. 
a bit like the hydrogen in the carbonic anhydrase mediated pathway. There's already a heap of potassium inside the cell, so there is a diffusion force driving it back out into the tubular fluid once it's no longer coupled to the others. This hap happens via a channel called ROMK, which stands for renal altomedullary potassium. It's related to the inward rectifier cha potassium channels present in the heart, for example. Meanwhile, the chloride has its own basolateral channel that it uses to exit. Careful viewers might notice that this is not electrically neutral, as the potassium doesn't go anywhere, and one positive sodium crosses from the lumen to the interstitium, along with two negative chlorides. This creates a relative positive charge in the lumen and a negative charge in the interstitium. This drives reabsorption of some other cations such as magnesium and calcium by paracellular routes. The NKCC2 co-transporter is inhibited by everyone's favorite class of diuretics, loop diuretics, such as furosemide. These are among the most effective diuretics for a number of reasons. The TAL is responsible for reabsorbing a large fraction of sodium, around 25%, and it's relatively distal such that only the DCT can compensate for the increased tubular sodium load. The other major factor is that NKCC2 is responsible for the single effect in the medullary osmolar gradient generation. This means that loop diuretics reduce the collecting duct's ability to concentrate urine. The combination of sodium excretion and impaired gradient means that an even greater water excretion relative to sodium, which is why aggressive diuresis with furosemide often causes hyponatremia. As the TAL is impervious to water, but reabsorbs sodium and chloride, the volume remains the same, but the concentration of solute becomes more dilute. Mutations in any of these ion channels, such as the ROMK, the chloride channel, or NKCC2, the transporter, um, or even the um, chloride-associated protein Barton, can cause the various subtypes of Barton's syndrome, which involve functional loss of NKCC2 with severe impairment of solute reabsorption and urine concentrating ability, causing hypovolemia and electrolyte disturbances similar to those seen with loop diuretics. Fortunately, these conditions are rare and unlikely to be of great relevance unless you're a pediatric nephrologist. At the end of the thick ascending limb, there is a cluster of about 10 to 20 specialized tubular epithelial cells per nephron, known as the macula densa. At this point, the distal nephron loops around to the vascular hilum of its own glomerulus, forming the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This site performs two important functions. One is tubuloglomerular feedback, which regulates the vascular tone of the afferent arteriole in response to distal solute, allowing short-term autoregulation of individual nephron GFR. The other major function is the secretion of renin. The juxtaglomerular apparatus consists of three major cell types, the macula densa, extraglomerular mesangial cells, and the so-called granular or juxtaglomerular cells which release renin. The role of the macula densa is to sense the arrival of excess sodium and chloride in the distal tubule. All three ions are required for the transporter to operate, but like in the thick ascending limb, the potassium is recycled, so it does not have a major influence on the sensor. The NKCC2 operates at minimal or close to equilibrium rate when the sodium chloride concentration is around 25 millimoles per litre, and at maximal rate when it's around 60 millimoles per litre. A proposed mechanism for the sensor is via chloride efflux, causing a relative depolarization of the basolateral membrane and activation of voltage-gated calcium channels, leading to elevated intracellular calcium. Finally, an apical NHE2 antibody is thought to cause an increase in intracellular pH in response to sodium influx. This combination of signals via inhibition of ERK1 and 2 and P38 kinase lead to inhibition of the enzymes cyclooxygenase 2 and nitric oxide synthase. These ionic and possibly also mechanical changes lead to activation of basolateral maxi anion channels, 
with the paracrine release of ATP and possibly adenosine. Via multiple receptors, these signals lead to constriction of vascular smooth muscle in the afferent arteriole and a decrease in glomerular hydrostatic pressure and GFR for that nephron. The reduction in GFR leads to negative feedback to the macula densa, with less sodium and chloride arriving and activating the sensor. This halts ATP release and disinhibits nitric oxide synthase, leading to vasodilation via nitric oxide release and the GMP pathway in uh, vascular smooth muscle. Loop diuretics are potent inhibitors of the NKCC2 sensor and will have the same effect. Meanwhile, disinhibition of COX-2 leads to release of prostaglandin E2, which activates EP4 receptors on granular cells. This leads to re the release of renin via the cyclic AMP pathway, which is the primary trigger for renin release. Other activators of the CAMP pathway can also stimulate renin release. For example, the juxtaglomerular apparatus is innervated by sympathetic nerves, as you can see on the right. Stimulation leads to noradrenaline release, which activates beta-1 adrenergic receptors and similarly activates renin release. While the G-alpha-S pathway stimulates renin release, increased intracellular calcium inhibits this pathway by a direct inhibition of adenylate cyclase 5 and breakdown of cyclic AMP by phosphodiesterase 1C. This is likely the pathway responsible for the baroreceptor response, where decreased perfusion stimulates renin release, or conversely, vascular stretch inhibits renin release. This is thought to be via the release of endothelin and inhibition of prostacyclin release in response to the stretch of endothelial cells. Renovascular hypertension is an example of pathological renin release in response to decreased baroreceptor and activation. Renin is a proteolytic enzyme that cleaves angiotensinogen from the liver to form angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then activated by angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE primarily in the lung to form angiotensin 2. This is a potent vasoconstrictor with multiple physiological effects but also triggers the release of further hormones including aldosterone from the adrenal cortex and vasopressin from the posterior pituitary also known as antidiuretic hormone. Vasopressin release is primarily stimulated after detection of increased osmolality in central osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, but this effect is amplified by angiotensin II, which signifies volume depletion. Looking back at the juxtaglomerular apparatus, circulating angiotensin II likely also activates G-alpha-Q in granular cells as a form of negative feedback. In the afferent arteriole, angiotensin II also causes vasoconstriction, but it causes greater vasoconstriction in the efferent arteriole, which increases glomerular hydrostatic pressure and therefore GFR. We're now at the early distal convoluted tubule, and we have a different transporter called NCC. Instead of sodium, potassium, and two chloride, it simply transports one sodium and one chloride. So you can think of it as a simplified version of the NKCC2 transporter. Again, it uses the same sodium gradient generated by the sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium is extruded basolaterally via this pump and chloride follows via its own channel. This is electrically neutral as there is one positive and negative entering and leaving. The DCT is also relatively impervious to water, so this further dilutes the tubular fluid. The transporter is the target of theazides and theazide-like diuretics like endapamide. Just quickly, not all of these drugs are chemically theazides, but if I refer to theazides for simplicity, I will mean all NCC inhibitor diuretics. Since this takes place more distally, there is less sodium to reabsorb so typically only about 5% is reabsorbed here. This means that theazides typically have a less potent effect on sodium excretion, although this can be amplified if loop diuretics are already in use. Apart from location of action, 
The other major difference is that the NCC does not contribute to the medullary or smaller gradient, so thiazides do not impair water reabsorption in the collecting duct like loop diuretics do. In fact, thiazides are notorious for causing hyponatremia, with it occurring in around 14% of chronic patients. This is likely because they cause pure sodium chloride excretion with mild hypovolemia and then counter-regulatory anti-diuretic hormone leads to water retention. Mutations of NCC can cause Gittleman syndrome, which is significantly milder than Barter's syndrome and resembles the effect of theazide therapy. Let's move a little bit further down the tubule. So once we reach the distal convoluted tubule and connecting ducts, things get a bit more interesting. We have the RLMK channel that recycle potassium in the thick ascending limb, although right now it's not doing an awful lot because NCC is electrically neutral and doesn't transport potassium. Now we're going to introduce the epithelial sodium channel or ENAC. Unlike NCC, this only transports sodium ions down its concentration gradient and immediately causes an imbalance of positive charge inside the cell. This displaces potassium back into the lumen via ROMK. Theazides cause hypokalemia because some of the excess tubular sodium enters the epithelium via ENAC now that NCC is blocked. This is also how loop diuretics cause hypokalemia. In that case, there's so much sodium entering the distal tubule that it enters via both channels. ENAC is also known as the amylaride sensitive channel because it is the target of the pot that potassium sparing diuretic. If you block ENAC, most of the sodium will still enter via NCC, so there's very little diuretic effect, but it will prevent potassium loss. Amylaride is often sold as combination therapy with hydrochlorothiazide to ameliorate some of the associated potassium wasting. So physiologically, what is the point of ENAC? Well, it allows aldosterone to regulate potassium excretion as stimulation of the mineralocorticoid receptor leads to upregulation of ENAC. Our other potassium sparing diuretics, such as spironolactone and aplerinone, are mineralocorticoid antagonists. Now you might be trying to remember at this point exactly what aldosterone does. We know that mineralocorticoid receptor agonists like flugocortisone are sometimes used to cause flu retention in patients with low blood pressure. We know that aldosterone is stimulated by angiotensin II, and angiotensin II is a peptide that's a G protein receptor agonist and vasoconstrictor, while aldosterone is a steroid hormone. Both of them act on the renal tubule in slightly differing ways. Angiotensin II is stimulated um, by renin release in response to low tubular sodium and low renal perfusion, indicating hypovolemia. In the tubule, angiotensin II specifically stimulates sodium retention while aldosterone stimulates both sodium retention and potassium wasting. That's because aldosterone release can be independently stimulated by hyperkalemia. So how does the tubule know what situation it's in? Well, apologies in advance, but it's through a complex network of protein kinases. Now you don't need to know this specifically and you won't remember any of the details and I'm just going to show you a simplified depiction of what the outcomes are. So SKG1 stands for serum and glycocorticoid inducible kinase, while WNK stands for with no lysine because it, an important lysine residue is in an atypical subdomain, and K is the one letter abbreviation for lysine. There's, a, there's different subtypes and KS means kidney specific. SPAC stands for SPS1-related proline-alanine-rich kinase. I'm fascinated by how biochemists name things. Anyway, the important part of the, is that due to this network, in hypovolemia, when you have both angiotensin II and aldosterone, it causes upregulation of NCC and sodium-potassium ATPase, causing increased salt retention and downregulation of ENAC and ROMK, so there's no major effect on potassium. On the other hand, in hyperkalemia, you don't have angiotensin II, but you do have independent release of aldosterone. So this downregulates NCC and upregulates both ENAC, ROMK, 
and the ACPase, causing active potassium secretion and relatively little sodium retention. Unlike sodium, most of the body's potassium is intracellular. So while with a normal GFR, the body's supply of sodium undergoes filtration every two hours, only 1% of the body's potassium undergoes filtration in that time. As a result, if you need to eliminate excess potassium, it needs to be actively secreted like you can see here. Now there's one more feature of the late distal tubule that I'll quickly mention here. Calcium ions are reabsorbed via the TRPV5 channel on the apical membrane. They are then shuttled across the basolateral membrane via the sodium calcium exchanger NCX. This is driven by the basolateral sodium gradient with the sodium being recycled by the nearby sodium potassium ATPase. This means that if there's an influx of sodium from the NCC transporter, this will compete and reduce the driving force for calcium absorption. As a result, thiazides have a unique effect of increasing calcium reabsorption. Physiologically, this process is regulated by parathyroid hormone, which activates an alpha S type G protein coupled receptor, which upregulates TRPV5 and inhibits NCC to promote renal conservation of calcium. Now let's keep moving. We're now in the cortical collecting duct. We still have ENAC and RMK, but not NCC anymore. Probably the most striking development is that we now have multiple cell types. Firstly, we have the main tubular epithelial cells known as principal cells. Next, we have intercalated cells, of which there are two major types. There's type A, or alpha intercalated cells, and type B, which is beta intercalated cells. There's also type non-A, non-B, and other subtypes, but I won't dwell on those. These intercalated cells play a significant role in fine-tuning acid-base regulation, though most takes place in the proximal tubule with the bulk reabsorption of sodium bicarbonate. I'll start with alpha cells which feature a number of different transport mechanisms based around the carbonic anhydrase reaction. Carbon dioxide freely diffuses between cells and is in a steady state with carbonic acid, which can reversibly dissociate into a proton and bicarbonate. Now, if this is supposed to be happening in equilibrium, why is it moving in the right direction? That's because the bicarbonate and protons are being removed, with the bicarbonate being transported basilaterally by an antiporter with chloride and the protons being actively extruded, extruded into the lumen. This is driven by two apical ATPases, the vacuolar type hydrogen ATPase that bears a passing resemblance to ATP synthase and a hydrogen potassium ATPase that's similar to the proton pump in the gastric epithelium. Potassium and extra chloride are also channeled back across the basolateral membrane by a symporter. Meanwhile, the opposite process is happening in the beta intercalated cells with the same carbonic anhydrase reaction, except this time hydrogen is secreted basolaterally by vacu the same vacuolar ATPase, and bicarbonate is secreted apically with, with a different bicarbonate chloride antiporter that's known as pendrin. And remember the difference with type A cells secreting acid and type B cells secreting base or bicarbonate. So why do we have both? Wouldn't the protein, protons and the bicarbonate neutralize each other? Well, that does happen to some extent. Um, protons and bicarbonate combine to make carbonic acid, which forms an equilibrium with carbon dioxide and water. Some of the carbon dioxide diffuses back out of the tubule if they're matched. Usually though, type A cells are more numerous and more active than type B, so there'll be an excess of protons in the lumen, lowering the pH. This causes ammonia, which um, if you recall, um, the kidney has part of the urea cycle enzymes and can act, actually create its own ammonia. Um, the uh, basic ammonia combines with protons in the low pH lumen, um, forming an ammonium cation that traps both the ammonia and the protons in the lumen. Both cell types can regulate key transporters over minutes to hours in response to changing acid-base status. 
In chronic metabolic acidosis, type A cells proliferate to enhance acid secretion, and in chronic metabolic alkalosis, there's an increase of type B cells, excreting more bicarbonate. Other adaptations to acid-base status, including respiratory disorders, are more subtle and include various changes in equilibrium and transmembrane gradients throughout the whole nephron. Now, at this point, there's not a whole lot left in the lumen in terms of solute. Most of it's been pumped out already um, in the thick ascending limb and the distal tubule. As these are both impervious to water, water remains and dilutes the urine, leaving primarily some waste products like urea. Inside the cell and in the interstitial space, there are many more solutes, creating an osmolar gradient that wants to draw water out of the tubule. If we look back at that principal cell in the center, there are aquaporins type, type, type 3 and 4, allowing equilibration of water across the basolateral membrane, but currently none on the apical membrane. Instead, aquaporin 2 channels are stored on intracellular vesicles that wait for the correct signal to fuse with the apical membrane and allow water to enter. As mentioned previously, vasopressin, or antidiuretic hormone, is released from the posterior pituitary, primarily in response to high osmolality, indicating water deficit. At even higher osmolality, these neural pathways also trigger the sensation of thirst, which means that urine concentration has already started by that point. Like angiotensin II, vasopressin is a peptide hormone and a vasoconstrictor, except the vasoconstrictin effect is mediated by the GQ-coupled V1 or V1A receptor, which is not present here. Instead, we have the GS-linked V2 receptor, which activates cyclic AMP and protein kinase A. Once this is activated, it triggers exocytosis of aquaporin 2 to the apical membrane, allowing water to passively diffuse across both membranes in a highly regulated manner. In medicine, V2 receptors can be stimulated selectively by desmopressin, also known as DDAVP, and non-selectively by exogenous vasopressin, terlipressin, or even oxytocin, which is another related hormone. This has a similar result to SIADH and can cause hyponatremia. Vasopressin receptor antagonists are known as VAPTANs. Tolvaptan is a V2-specific inhibitor, which is effectively a pure aquaretic, preventing water reabsorption via aquaporin-2 channels. This effect is similar to diabetes insipidus. V2 receptors have another effect in the collecting duct, but for that we need to go deeper into the medulla for our last stop. We're now in the inner medullary collecting duct. At this point, there are no longer any intercalated cells. Most useful solutes have been reabsorbed. There are still vasopressin regulated aquaporins reabsorbing water. And as before, vasopressin activates the cyclic AMP pathway leading to fusion of aquaporin two vesicles with the apical membrane. Except here, the pathway also activates urea transporters causing urea reabsorption. This process is passive and enhanced in states of antidiuresis, as with less water, the relative concentration of urea increases. This recycling process can increase the medullary concentrating ability up to around 1,200 milliosmoles per kilo. The decreased efficiency of urea excretion leads to an increase in plasma urea concentration, such that more urea is filtered leading to a new steady state. This is also why a relative increase in plasma urea concentration versus creatinine can indicate a dehydrated antidiuretic state. One other effect of vasopressin that's not pictured is an increase in the furosemide sensitive NKCC2 transporter in the thick ascending limb that once again increases concentrating ability. now finished our in-depth look at tubular epithelium, so I will talk about some broader principles. More, most activity happens in the proximal tubule with about two-thirds of both solute and water being reabsorbed together. Water is extracted in the descending loop and then solute is 
extracted on the way back up. The fluid is maximally diluted by the thick ascending limb and distal tubule through solute removal and then concentrated as needed in the collecting ducts by water reabsorption. To look at some typical numbers for sodium, two thirds is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, then nothing in the thin limb, a quarter in the thick ascending limb, 5% in the distal tubule, and about half that in the collecting ducts. This leaves a remaining fraction of about 0.8% of filtered sodium that remains in, in the urine, known as the fractional excretion of sodium. We can calculate this for any solute, ignoring how much is removed or secreted where, because it's just the quantity that's left in the urine divided by the quantity that's filtered. Unfortunately, we can't just use concentration for this because an unknown quantity of water is reabsorbed as well. So to normalize the concentrations, we use another substance that is completely filtered and not secreted or reabsorbed, typically creatinine. Dividing each concentration by the concentration of creatinine in that fluid removes the differences induced by the changes in water. The fractions can be rearranged like this. Because they're all fractions, it doesn't matter what units you use as long as you use the same units for blood and urine concentration of each solute. This is particularly important to check with creatinine because it can be reported in milligrams per deciliter, micromoles per, deci micromoles per liter, which is typical for plasma, or potentially millimoles per liter in urine because the urine concentration is much higher. Just convert one of them so that the units for urine and plasma are the same. This equation works for many solutes, but if you look at the glomerulus just in the top left there, um, the total plasma concentration won't always be valid if the solute is protein bound, as, the, as that portion isn't filtered. Instead, we need to multiply the value by a factor which gives the approximate free portion. We, that's known as the fraction unbound. 0 0.7 is a common factor used for magnesium as 30% is typically protein bound. Calcium is also significantly protein bound, but we can measure ionized calcium and in that case, we don't need to use the conversion. Finally, you can simplify the equation um, in order to estimate how much water is reabsorbed you just eliminate the solute terms and divide plasma creatinine by urine creatinine. Speaking of which, let's break down the um, fraction of water reabsorbed. In the proximal tubule, it's the same two thirds as the sodium because of isoosmolar reabsorption. In the thin limb, it's concentrated, so about 15% of filtered water is removed here. In the thick ascending limb, and the distal tubule, there's no water reabsorbed. And this is say for the collecting ducts where between eight and 17% is reabsorbed depending on the concentrating mechanism and vasopressin signaling. This gives a final fraction of roughly one to 10% excreted, which is at least a tenfold range and works out to a final osmolality of between 50 and 1200 milliosmoles per kilo as mentioned before. We can now break down diuretic drugs based on the physiological determinants of urine output. The most important determinant determining factor is obviously GFR. You can't excrete water that wasn't filtered. Next, you have the quantity of filtered solute and what fraction of that is reabsorbed. And then finally, you have the variable reabsorption of water, which is influenced by urine concentrating mechanism and ADH. The determinants of GFR are complex and beyond the scope of this video, but drugs that can increase this include inotropes, which increase cardiac output, including caffeine, vasopressors, particularly dopamine, as well as the antihypertensive D1 um, receptor agonist, uh, phenoldopam. ACE inhibitors and ARBs and even NSAIDs can actively decrease GFR through inhibition of renin angiotensin signaling. Uh, in the latter, remember that the macula densa signaling involves prostaglandin E2 and prostacyclin. Proximal diuretics, including acetazolamide and SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, 
will acutely reduce GFR by about 20% through tubuloglomerular feedback mechanisms. Theazides cause a smaller reduction and loop diuretics are relatively neutral. Mannitol likely increases GFR immediately, but it is thought to be nephrotoxic with large cumulative doses, possibly due to hyperosmolar effects on the tubule. Mannitol's main effect on urine output is by adding to the quantity of filtered solute that's not reabsorbed. Naturetics inhibit the reabsorption of sodium, while aquaretics inhibit the reabsorption of water in the collecting ducts. I'm now going to review the different types of diuretics. We haven't really mentioned uh, much about osmotic diuretics at this point. Um, the mechanism of action for something like mannitol starts right in the proximal tubule uh, after the glomerulus. They're administered in bulk and freely filtered at the glomerulus. This increases solute and osmolality um, through the entire nephron as mannitol is minimally reabsorbed, only about 7 to 10%. Due to poor GI absorption, it needs to be given IV. It's most commonly used in critical care for the emergent management of raised intracranial pressure as it can draw in fluid from tissues through osmosis. That said, mannitol's volume of distribution is roughly equivalent to the volume of extracellular fluid rather than blood and increases intravascular volume, so that would likely exacerbate pulmonary edema, for example. Once filtered, the increased osmolality reduces the osmolar gradient and prevents water reabsorption. This happens through the entire nephron, but the effect is most significant in the proximal tubule. As the quantity of water remaining in the tubule increases, the gradient for all other solutes is impaired, causing a further moderate decrease in sodium reabsorption, though not as marked as for water. This is known again as solute drag. Mannitol is sometimes also recommended for prevention of kidney injury associated with rhabdomyolysis and specifically crush injury, mostly due to the large amount of tubular flow that it generates. This is controversial and generally not recommended due to limited evidence and the possibility of harm. Our next proximal tubule diuretics are SGLT2 inhibitors like dapagliflozin. As you can expect, the main effect of these is glucosuria, increasing the fractional excretion of glucose from almost zero uh, to up around 27% um, in new glycemic patients. In hyperglycemia, this effect can be even up to 60% as the glucose reabsorption mechanisms are already somewhat overwhelmed. Large glucosuria in itself can work as an osmotic diuretic similar to mannitol as we see in poorly controlled diabetes. As they work very proximally and there are plenty of other mechanisms for sodium and water reabsorption, the overall naturetic and diuretic effect is small with an absolute increase of about 0.4%. This effect is amplified to um, around 1.7% if the patient is already taking a loop diuretic. Adverse effects include euglycemic DKA in type 2 diabetics, and an increased, use, uh, increased risk of urinary tract infection and even uh, Fournier's gangrene in some populations. The last proximal tubule diuretic is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, acetazolamide. It's heavily protein bound and not freely filtered, but actively secreted by transporters in the proximal tubule. As we saw before, it slows down the equilibrium reaction across two key points during the reabsorption of sodium and bicarbonate. As that process is isoosmolar, it also prevents water reabsorption. The NHE-NBC pathway accounts for about a third of all sodium reabsorption um, in the proximal tubule, or 22% of all filtered sodium, which would make acetazolamide a very potent naturetic, except most of this sodium is simply reabsorbed more distally, particularly in the thick ascending limb. This leaves a final fractional excretion of about 6%, but potentially much larger in combination. As it doesn't act on chloride, acetazolamide induces a proximal renal tubular acidosis, so can be particularly useful for patients with a metabolic alkalosis. There has been a lot of thought that it might be useful to encourage breathing in patients with type two respiratory failure by reversing metabolic compensation, but there's never been any evidence of benefit in critical care and some possible harm I suspect it's just too blunt an intervention for that purpose. It is, pop 
popular to prevent altitude sickness by a similar mechanism. It's probably worth mentioning that most commonly used diuretics have some carbonic anhydrase in activity, which is understandable given their similar origins and chemical structures. Acetazolamide is the most potent and broadly active, particularly against type 2 and 4, which are the most significant in the nephron. Even so, it needs to be given in quite large doses, 250 to 500 milligrams a day, which would suggest that the inhibition by the other drugs with lower affinity at lower doses would not be clinically significant. Back to everyone's favorite, the loop diuretics. Furosemide is the most commonly used. It has a variable oral bioavailability, which is decreased by food. It's often quoted that the effect lasts six hours, but this is factoring in time for typical oral absorption. Given intravenously, it has a half-life of less than two hours, with a peak effect at 30 minutes. Like acetazolamide, furosemide is highly protein-bound and secreted into the proximal tubule. It then acts on the NKCC2 co-transporter, inhibiting sodium and chloride transfer into the medullary interstitium. This is where the second effect um, becomes important as loop diuretics reduce the osmolality um, of the medullary interstitium, further decreasing the effective absorption of water. By concentrating the plasma and excreting chloride, furosemide increases plasma strong ion difference and can induce a metabolic alkalosis. Potassium is recycled in the thick ascending limb so the effect on potassium loss is indirect in the distal tubule and cortical collecting system. Some sodium is reabsorbed in the distal tubule and this compensation increases with chronic use. Fumetanide is very similar to furosemide, but has 20 to 40 times the relative potency and more reliable oral bioavailability, making it potentially advantageous for outpatient therapy. Non-renal adverse effects include hypersensitivity reactions, including vasculitis light -like rashes and ototoxicity with high doses. If you are needing to give high doses, you should try to do so in the most efficient way possible to minimize total exposure. I'll discuss strategies for this shortly. Toxicity can also be additive with drugs such as aminoglycosides. Theazides act more distally, so are relatively less potent and lack the medullary effects of the loop diuretic, so relatively more sodium is excreted than water. They can cause the greatest potassium loss up to twice the quantity initially filtered. Amylaride works on an adjacent mechanism, preventing the unbalanced reabsorption of sodium in exchange for potassium excretion. Mineralocorticoid antagonists have a very similar effect to amylaride, but work indirectly and probably um, somewhat more broadly. Spironolactone notably has a very long duration of effect, over 24 hours due to an active metabolite, making it potentially very dangerous in renal impairment due to the risk of hyperkalemia. A pleronone is much shorter acting, about five hours, so might be a safer alternative in these cases. It's also more specific for the mineralocorticoid receptor, eliminating some of spironolactone's androgen blocking side effects. Finally, we have the aquaretics, um, such as tolbaptan, which cause almost pure water excretion by blocking vasopressin 2 receptors in the collecting duct. This can cause a tiny naturesis of about 0.5% fractional excretion as V2 receptors also upregulate NKCC2 and apparently ENAC activity in the um, tubules. I'll mention these agents briefly at the end, but their use in the correction of hyponatremia is beyond the scope of this video. To summarize, um, these are the maximal uh, solute fractional excretions you typically expect to see with each diuretic class from what I was able to gather um, through various resources. Again, these are absolute proportions, so how much is actually excreted as a fraction of what is filtered. Normal ranges can be a bit tricky because the physiological numbers will vary significantly if the body is in a state of depletion or excess. The normal estimates are for steady state. We can see that um, with diuretics, the um, sodium fractional excretion is relatively low, both for very distal and very proximal agents for different reasons.
and loop diuretics are in about the optimal position for naturesis. The numbers are very similar for water, affirming that sodium is the primary driver of volume excretion in most cases. Tolvaptan is an exception, obviously, as it mostly causes free water loss. Potassium loss is fairly predictable, being significant with many diuretics except for the two potassium sparing classes and maximal for NCC inhibitors like the theazides. Magnesium almost perfectly matches potassium but with a lower magnitude. Calcium is interesting with the theazide like drugs being the only calcium sparing diuretics for reasons we discussed in the late distal tubule section. As a result, theazides can potentially cause hypergalcemia and um, frusamide and other loop diuretics are potentially used in the treatment of hypercalcemia. Chloride mostly follows sodium and phosphate is naturally excreted at pretty high rates but increased with some. Bicarbonate loss is impaired by loop and theazide diuretics and increased by most of the others, particularly acetosolamide. Glucose predictably is increased um, most uh, to the only significant extent with the SGLT2 inhibitors um, up to 27% or like I said sort of into much higher ranges in hyperglycemia. Now urea is very interesting. Its loss is the only significant um, only significantly increased by proximal tubule agents like mannitol, acetazolamide or by tolvaptan. And the latter is due to the mechanism by which vasopressin induces urea transporters. Now, I mentioned that urea is a marker of antidiuresis, but it can potentially be a more precise indicator of intrinsic renal disease. In AKI, we can use imaging to exclude post-renal causes, but it can be a little harder to differentiate renal impairment that's simply due to hypoperfusion from intrinsic renal tubular injury, such as the so-called acute tubular necrosis. In this video, we've seen the most obvious function of the renal tubular epithelium is reabsorption of filtered sodium. So that is the first sort of metric and increased uh, fraction, fractional excretion of sodium is a sensitive marker of renal tubular injury. Unfortunately, as we can see here, almost any diuretic therapy will ruin that test as most of them are naturetics. As a result, people move from sodium to urea as this is not um, really affected by the most commonly used diuretics. The usual cutoffs are 2% for sodium and 35% for urea. If the fractional excretion of urea is less than 35%, it means that the mechanisms of reabsorption in the proximal tubule and collecting duct are working fine and an AKI would be entirely pre-renal. If the fractional excretion is more than 35%, this is more suggestive of tubular injury. I will also note that in a well hydrated individual, urea, um, individual urea excretion can also increase, typically to the 50 to 60% range. So clinical context is still important. To calculate the fractional excretion of any solute, you need matched plasma and urine samples and a measure of the concentration of solute and creatinine in both, and then use the simple equation that we mentioned earlier. It's honestly a good thing that diuretics don't work as well as the fractional excretion numbers might suggest. If a loop diuretic consistently blocked 25% of sodium and water reabsorption, a patient with a GFR of 125 would lose 45 liters of fluid a day. It would be like having cholera. While sometimes frustrating to uh, clinicians, diuretic resistance is evidence of the body's attempt to maintain homeostasis despite our meddling. It is a heterogeneous phenomenon which can be broken into three groups based on time course, immediate, short term and chronic. Immediate adaptation involves intrinsic renal processes that limit the potential potency of a diuretic. For example, um, the immediate distal reabsorption means that Acetazolamide causes fractional excretion of sodium of around 6% rather than the theoretical 22%. Short term is also known as postdiuretic sodium retention. This is an antinaturetic effect once the um, diuretic dose has worn off. It occurs due to a combination of renal and systemic 
responses to decreased extracellular fluid volume. Mechanisms include activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and sympathetic simulation. The duration of action of oral furosemide is approximately six hours due to the effects of GI absorption. This means that with once daily dosing, the patient will experience 18 hours of reflex sodium retention. You can see on this diagram, which I took from Oxford textbook of nephrology, which, um, what this looks like in six hour blocks over time. The dotted line is the patient's baseline sodium excretion, and they're consistently well below it um, until the next dose of loop diuretic. Then we have chronic, which is sometimes also called breaking phenomenon. This is a decreased ma uh, magnitude of effect with repeat doses of diuretic, which you can also see on the diagram. It's part of the same homeostatic processes um, and potential mechanisms include hypertrophy and upregulation of transporters in distal segments. For example, patients on loop diuretic therapy, um, the tubular epithelium in the distal tubule can increase to double its previous cell mass. The result of these combined effects is that a patient initiated on diuretic therapy at a given dose will typically lose salt and fluid volume over a period of approximately one to two weeks before reaching a new steady state and then not losing any further fluid unless the dose is increased. This limits potential harm of excessive volume loss, but it can be counterproductive if the patient re remains above their target volume. So how can we optimize therapy, especially if the patient requires more aggressive fluid removal? One step, especially with outpatients, would be to ensure that the patient is actually taking the medication and maintaining a consistent, relatively restricted intake of sodium. Remember, in general, sodium determines volume status, whereas water determines osmolality. If you simply restrict a patient's water intake, they will get thirstier, which is a difficult thing to ignore. If a patient is on an unrestricted salt diet and only being diuresed for a fraction of the day, it's perfectly possible that post-diuretic salt retention will completely negate any attempt at volume loss. Also remember that GFR is the most important determinant of urine output. So ma manage their AKI, don't poison them, give inotropes and vasopressors as required and check they don't have abdominal compartment syndrome or a post-renal obstruction. For oral furosemide, consider taking it on an empty stomach or changing to bumesonide, which has more reliable oral bioavailability. If concerned about bioavailability in an inpatient setting, um, you can change the route to intravenous, although note that this will reduce the duration of action and potentially extend the post-dose interval. Increasing dosing frequently, frequency will um, counter that short-term resistance by reducing the window for salt retention. We often see patients re receive furosemide mane and noon because you don't want them having nocturia, but this is suboptimal. If they're hospitalized with a catheter, give it 12 hourly or eight hourly even. This is probably even more important when it's intravenous due to the short duration of effect. I'm sure we've all seen the urine output chart where the patient is oligouric, they get a dose of IV furosemide, pass 700 mils of urine over two hours and then go back to being oligouric until the next dose. These swings in physiology are, not, are probably not healthy. For optimal effect, furosemide should be given as a continuous infusion. It's recommended to start with a bolus and followed by an infusion of 10 milligrams an hour, then titrated to effect. This intervention alone will lead to adequate volume reduction in most patients. It's the same principle as using a beta-lactam antibiotic. You want as little time as possible below the minimum threshold concentration. If all of that's not enough, you probably need to think about a different target. Diuretic combination therapy falls into two subtypes. Probably the most common one is adding a potassium sparing agent, for example, combining a milleride with a theazide or sporolactone with furosemide. This typically limits the hypokalemia generated by non-potassium sparing agents. As you might also recall, they do not have huge intrinsic effects on sodium reabsorption, although there may be some synergistic effect. Mineralocorticoid blockade may have particular benefit in certain 
patient subgroups such as cardiac failure and cirrhosis where spironolactone is actually first line. Just be careful if they have renal impairment. The other approach is known as sequential, sequential nephron blockade. This is when your patient just isn't responding to one class, presumably because the other nephron segments are compensating. Options include a loop diuretic with acetazolamide or a loop diuretic with a theazide. The latter is likely going to be most effective in terms of fluid removal, although I'd pr probably consider this too dangerous to be performed outside of a closely monitored setting. Finally, you could consider adding, adding a Vaptan in select patients. If they're retaining water, they might have relatively little filtered sodium and chloride for the diuretics to work on. They're quite new drugs, so patient-oriented benefits are still under investigation, though they certainly augment fluid removal in cardiac failure patients. It does seem more sensible than administering hypertonic saline, which is another strategy that's been suggested in this patient group. Finally, while this is a talk about diuretics, they're not the only option. If your patient is in oligouric renal failure, it might just be in their best interest to start them on dialysis. So I'm not going to mention more in the way of specific dosing strategies or individual studies. This talk was mainly designed around basic science concepts. But like in the pulmonary vasodilators video, I did want to include a quick reference that people could use for specific clinical suggestions. So I found this review article from Europe last year, which is excellent and very comprehensive. It's about 10 pages long. It's available for free online and the link will be in the description. I'm a little annoyed that they basically use the same subtitle as me, but I recommend you check it out. To summarize, filtration of most small molecules is dependent on GFR and protein binding. The quantity of filtered water and solutes is massive and most needs to be reabsorbed. Reabsorption of all sodium and most other solutes is driven by the sodium potassium ATPase. Most solute regulation is by changes in fractional reabsorption with some secretion, for example, potassium ammonia. Water reabsorption is passive and driven by the medullary osmolar gradient, half of which is urea. The equations for fractional excretion of solute are shown above. Frac uh, Fu is the unbound fraction and make sure that the units, especially for creatinine, are matching. Feedback mechanisms can cause sodium reabsorption as soon as a diuretic becomes subtherapeutic. The optimal dosing strategy for a loop diuretic is a continuous intravenous infusion. Theazides are the only class that enhance calcium reabsorption. Spironolactone has a very long duration of action due to active metabolites. Blockade of sequential nephron segments will have a large synergistic effect on sodium and fluid excretion. Optimize supportive management for patients with AKI and consider extracorporeal therapy. Now I just want to mention some of my favorite books. I used all of these as references at various points along with a lot of journal articles. Um, people often use Vander's renal physiology, perhaps because it's very short. I did use it, but I found it uh, a little bit inaccessible. Um, renal physiology, a clinical approach, is a great book, but it's over 10 years old at this point. If I had to recommend just one compact renal physiology book, it would be Mos definitely Mosby's uh, renal physiology shown here. It's extremely clear, straightforward with its text and diagrams. Um, renal Pathophysiology, The Essentials, is a very dense little book, um, which is more of a disease-based approach that you might find useful. If you want a comprehensive text for renal physiology, I would pick um, Selden and Gierbich's uh, The Kidney. This was my backup reference for most of this presentation and it inspired the anatomical diagrams I used at the start. Finally, for a more comprehensive ICU-based text with detailed coverage of renal replacement therapies, you can't go past critical care nephrology. I'm sure you can find ways to access this online. Um, for more general books, I also use this standard pharmacology text, which has a nice diuretics chapter. 
the renal section of this medical physiology book is um, very good, uh, particularly some of its diagrams of tubular tissue. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Guyton and Hall. Um, the last book is this one on fluid electrolytes and acid-based physiology. This is fantastic if you want some of the more technical quantitative aspects. It uses a bunch of clinical cases, probably very useful for ICU nads, although I will mention they only pay brief lip service to Stewart's acid-based theory, which I think loses a, a point or two. As always, deranged physiology is uh, the first go-to reference for these topics, and it's freely available online. I wanted to mention a YouTube channel, Biomed Sessions with Ruse. Um, she doesn't have many videos, but they're very good, and the Loop of Henley Explained video was the clearest description of the countercurrent mechanism that I've seen, and it's what I based mine off, so check her channel out if you're interested. Finally, there's this nephrology blog, um, which I've just discovered um, that contains a ton of useful content, including links to even more resources. It's named Precious, Li Precious Bodily Fluids after a phrase from the legendary film Dr. Strangelove. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please like or comment. Also check out my other videos and subscribe if you want to see more. Next video is going to be on the neuromuscular junction, hopefully significantly shorter and out sooner than this one. Bye until then.